like to uh, convene us and uh, without further ado, uh, introduce you once again to uh, Deborah Mumford. Deborah, as I said earlier, comes to us um, by way of Kinston, North Carolina, her original home. She graduated from Howard University in Washington, D.C. in, wait for it, mechanical engineering. Oh, no. um, and, and had a real life in another world before uh, experiencing the cult of industry, which led her to the American Baptist Seminary of the West, uh, affiliated with the American Baptist Church, in which she's ordained, and then on to the Graduate Theological Union at Berkeley for a PhD in homiletics and New Testament. Um, she uh, is the Frank Caldwell Professor of Homiletics at Louisville Seminary and also uh, works in the Money Matters uh, program that she may tell us something about. Um, she's a distinguished leader in her field and in the life of that seminary. Uh, she's going to be talking with us, as she indicated this morning, about uh, her uh, doctoral and primary research work. Her book is called Exploring Prosperity, Preaching, Biblical Health, Wealth, and Wisdom. It was published in 2012 by Judson Press. Uh, Deborah, it's such a privilege to welcome you here and uh, we welcome you to this company of friends. And she will uh, speak and then entertain your questions. So let's welcome again Deborah Mumford. Um, 
of, of where it came from, what are some of its primary tenets, and then we're going to open up for some questions. Does that sound like a good plan? All right, so the uh, prosperity gospel as we know it, the seeds were sown back in the late 19th and the early 20th century. There was an evangelist, pastor, and teacher named Essex Willie Kenyon who combined new thought metaphysics with teaching about Pentecostal and holiness uh, ways of being. And so when I talk about new thought teaching, what I mean by that is that there was a way of teaching that said, you can create your own reality uh, by your thinking. So if you were sick, it was probably a problem with your thinking, right? So not physical, none of that. And you had to change your thinking. If you were not, if you were not successful in life, then you needed to change the way you were thinking. You should be more positive. You should surround yourself by more uh, affluent and successful people, so you can create the reality in which you live. That's the key for new thought metaphysics. So Kenyon had seen that there were people in his day who were being successful in, in, in reporting this new thought metaphysics. So what he thought he would do would be to combine Christianity and, and his belief in Jesus Christ as Savior with new thought metaphysics. And he did that. And those were the seeds um, that were sown for prosperity God. He taught um, uh, that material prosperity was a promise from God, and also that believers needed to take authority and they should never confess something that was negative. So what did that mean? Well, even if you were feeling sick, you should never say it out loud. Because by confessing that you were sick, you were making your sickness a reality well into the future. So, <laughs> it's like, okay, isn't that just the reality? Well, yeah. Uh, but he said that by, by confessing it, then you were just making that part of your life. So rather than say, I'm sick, even if you were feeling sick, you should say, I'm well. Right? And then you would live into that. And so that's part of... Uh, the prosperity gospel. Now, Kenyon, so he was the first one who, who had this type of theology. One more thing about that. Victory over sickness and disease is a major part of that. They did not believe that if you're a Christian, you should be going to the doctor, right? If you had to go to the doctor, it's because you didn't have enough faith to ask God to heal you. Because if you had enough faith, God would indeed just do that. And of course, to justify that, they point to all the healing stories we find in the New Testament and say, didn't Jesus heal these people, right, when they asked for help? And just as Jesus healed them, Jesus will heal you if you have enough faith. Now, there are all kinds of holes with that. We're going to get to some of that in just a little bit. Um, but So Kenyon laid the foundation in the, in the 1960s. There was this man who came after him named Kenneth Hagin. And he was a white Southern Baptist preacher who converted to uh, uh, Pentecostalism because he said they had a lot more spirit than the Southern Baptists back in that day. And he began preaching also, coincidentally, that reality is created in the mind and that, uh, uh, and affirmed in the speech of believers through positive confession. And you say, could that have been a coincidence? That's what he started to uh, preach and teach. And he claimed that as his own theology. Well, of course, years later, there's this book that comes out called A Different Gospel that said he plagiarized the theology of Kenyon and that he used that to start this thing called the Word of Faith Movement, which is known as the Prosperity Gospel. Now, what kind of foundation can you lay when it's laid on, it's built upon theft? I don't know. But, <laughs> but he, uh, Kenneth Hagin actually built this movement, the Word of Faith movement. And he had a school, Rama, Rama Word uh, Bible Institute uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, and there's some more about Tulsa that we'll get to in just a bit. So Kenneth Hagin is 
the one who actually took this prosperity gospel and began to teach and preach it on radio. He began to teach and preach it on television. But he also, with the school, which is a very smart way, if you have a new theology, get some new adherents and have them go through your school so they, so your theology outlives you for, for, for decades and centuries. And that's what he did. So, um, so when we talk about just the, some of the, the, the tenets of prosperity gospel, uh, one of the things that is core to understanding the prosperity gospel is also the teachings of landing all Roberts. Have you heard of him? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. like, yeah, you know, all Roberts? Yes. Well, all Roberts, his doctrine called see faith is the core of the economy, the divine economy, which is one of the keys to understanding prosperity gospel. So for, if we look at Oral Roberts' teaching, he separated, it was very dualistic, there was the world's economy, which all of us participate, and then he said there was a the divine economy, which, which operates very differently. And you may say, well, how does that work? Yes, well, let's talk about that. So now, Oral Roberts is his sea faith. He said there were three core principles to his sea faith theology that if applied properly to the lives of believers, they were supposed to ensure that they would have an abundant life. And that's what everybody who uh, listened to him, you want, you want an abundant life. So the first core principle, and this is one we probably can probably agree with, is that Christians should turn their lives completely over to God by recognizing that God and not humanity is the source of all of their blessings. Most of us can get with that. It's like, well, that sounds good. We're off to a good start. Well, let's talk about the second core principle, which is the principle of sowing and reaping. That is important. Whatever the believer gives freely to God becomes a seed for God to multiply back to the believer in the form of their needs. Now, this is, this is important. And when the believer sows seeds of any kind, whether they sow seeds of talent or time or love or compassion or especially money, it is prosperity gospel, uh, they will receive those things in return. So if believers want God to supply their financial needs, then of course they need to give money into ministries. They need to give seed money to God that God will reproduce and multiply back to them. So now Roach is very clear, I'm careful to differentiate between seed faith giving and tithing. There's a very big, big difference. Seed faith giving is done before a miracle is manifested. And tithing is done after you have received some money, right? So see, faith, you don't have any money yet. You're just giving, hopefully hoping that God will give this money back to you. Now, Roberts explained that giving to God means giving to a church or to someone to whom God directs you. So if you go in prosperity preaching churches, the expectation is that you will, of course, give not just the tithe, the tithe is the base. Everybody at the church is supposed to give 10% of everything they make uh, as, as, as the bottom line, but then you're also supposed to give offerings. And it is upon those offerings that God will uh, work a miracle on your behalf. So, so for example, there was a time when Roberts and his wife Evelyn were struggling to pay their rent. And he was led by God to give a sea faith offering to God. And after he gave the offering, the man who was a member of Robert's church that he was pastoring gave Robert seven times the offering Robert had given to the church. Isn't that wonderful? Now that's a good story. We hope it's true. Um, but, but, but what that did every time he told that story in his congregation, of course, it, it helped people to kind of loosen up their purse strings and give into the ministry. And he built this huge ministry as a result of people tithing, sowing seeds into his ministry. 
so, so that was one of the, the second core principles, was the, the principle of sowing and reaping. So if we go back and we talk about the, the story of the widow's mind, right, that we talked about in uh, Mark chapter 12, the reason the prosperity preachers like that so much is that they preach it, preach it so that when the widow gives those two copper coins, that she's giving a, a seed faith offering. Right? And that God will multiply back to her multifold. And just like she gave all that she had, people should give all that they have to multiply. So God will multiply back to them uh, multifold all that they have given. Now, there's so, several problems with that, and, <laughs> and, uh, and we will talk about some of those. Uh, but the third core principle of the seed faith is, offering is to expect a miracle at, immediately after you have given that offering. If you know anything about Oral Roberts, so expect a miracle was a big part of his ministry. Right? Um, so those are the three core principles. Now, what are the problems with this? I guess we can, we can talk about this all day, actually. Um, but some of the problems were, were many. Uh, I equate that um, there was a, actually, uh, you, do you remember back um, when the economy went bust um, in, in uh, it was 2007, 2008? Yeah. What some people uh, found was there were, there were a lot of people who had been part of prosperity preaching churches who had got uh, signed up for some of those subprime mortgages, right? They did that because they had often, some of those pastors had invited some of the lenders into their congregations to sign people up for some of those subprime mortgages. And they did that without reading all of the fine print because the pastors presented it as since they were faithful to God, God was rewarding them with the opportunity to buy a house that they would otherwise not have been able to afford. So some of these people signed up for subprime mortgages without reading the fine print. And of course, some of those houses, you know, they went belly up. They couldn't, when, they, when uh, the adjustable rate adjusted up high, uh, they had to leave those, those, those homes but some of them thought that those homes were a blessing uh, based on faith because they said, the pastor said, you've been faithful, right? You've, you've given your tithe, you've given your offering. So here's a lender who will get you into the house you've been dreaming about, and it is a reward for your faithfulness. So some of this is tied up into some of these um, it's, it's, it's actually very, very tragic when you think about that. But if you think about the issues that there are with the divine economy, buying a home without a, a clear means of paying a monthly note on faith, it says, okay, I'm going to just step out of faith because God is going to supply all of my needs according to God's riches. It's like, well, how about the reality is maybe you should talk to a mortgage lender. You know how much you make every month. How about get a mortgage based on that rather than have a mortgage based on faith? So problems. It's kind of like tempting God, right? So I'm going to sign up for this and I expect God to help me meet this mortgage every month. So there were problems. There's so many issues with that. But a lot of people... Um, somehow got caught up in that system. And that's just one example of how prosperity preaching actually works. Now, one of the other tenets of uh, prosperity gospel, they have to explain somehow uh, that the central figure of the gospel, Jesus Christ, what do you do with his being poor? Right? Um, I mean, it's like, so you said, uh, for, um, Foxes have holes and, and birds of the air has nests, but the, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So, so what do you do with the central figure of the gospel? Well, he doesn't have a lot of material things. Then you try to justify and you say, well, Jesus wasn't poor. 
that doesn't work very well, but they try to get away with that. And, and, and then they claim that Jesus was not poor. And since they contend, look, but then they also contend that poverty is a curse. It's a curse. That they, and they must argue, therefore, that Jesus is poor and that poverty is a curse. And that if people are actually being blessed by God, they would not be poor. So the problem, against many, many problems with that, it denies the socioeconomic injustices that exist in the world. There are systems in place that keep some people in poverty while some have. But they put all of the onus on the individual people, people rather than the system that, that keeps uh, some people in the poverty. Uh, a lot of the prosperity preachers actually deny uh, social justice ills altogether. It's a very individualistic gospel that if you, again, have faith, then you're not going to have <coughs> issues with your health, you're not going to have issues with money, and if you do, uh, then, then maybe you have not been adhering to, to, to the word being preached by the prosperity preachers faithfully. Uh, so maybe you need to go back and do better about that. So also, um, the problem of believing that uh, poverty is a curse is that, of course, first century Judaism, the people, uh, the poor were people who owned the land and had few financial resources. And we can go through some of the Gospels. Um, and, but, but, but Jesus was considered poor by socioeconomic standards of his day. But the prosperity preachers do not recognize the, the validity of people being poor at all. So when we talk about uh, prosperity gospel, um, while faith, hope, and, and some, of, some of the things that, that I think are positive about it, there's a lot of negative, uh, but, but some of the things that are positive is one, every week when people listen to the prosperity gospel, they can get a message of hope. Hope that their tomorrow can be different than today. Uh, also, one of the things that they get is a, is a, is a foundation in faith, in faith. They believe that God can do anything. Uh, and so some of them take the prosperity gospel as a means of empowerment. If they can do anything through Christ, then some of them feel empowered that they can go to school, they can get the job they want. So it's a, it's a way of self-empowerment. And so it's not all negative, though much of it is, right? So, 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 so that's one of the problems. So faith is, is a core principle. Hope that their tomorrow can be different than their today. There's also the issue of personal accountability. When you talk about positive prosperity gospel, the expectation is that every week when they go to church, that people say, you need to take responsibility for your life and the circumstances in which you find yourself. Sometimes they may go over to um, the extreme, but personal accountability is also part of that. So these are some of the gifts that uh, are, are accompanied, but, but one of the pr uh, primary shortcomings, of course, is they are taught not as a means, not as, a, 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 as just a good thing, but as a way of becoming rich. So adherents are taught to have faith in God, so God will bless them, so they will get rich. Uh, a better day, uh, the better day they are taught to hope for is fraught with dreams of material wealth and luxury cars, designer clothes, large homes, unlimited amounts of cash. That's the, the dream that they get when they are in prosperity churches. They are taught to live righteously so that God will make them rich. So, so there's this expectation I'm going to do this so that I get the benefits. Now we can go back and argue is all of Christian do, do all of us Christians expect to receive some benefits from God? Something. It may not be material wealth, but we believe we may uh, be blessed by God some, somehow for being faithful. Uh, we may believe that God will help us and protect us if we are in trouble. We can call on God and expect God to help us. 
we may expect some benefits, but to have a, a defined benefit uh, that I will be rich is a little bit different, right? So that's a little bit different. They are taught to seek the anointing of the Holy Spirit so they can prosper in every way. And so some of those vital aspects, some of those expectations are contorted and distorted in an attempt to fit them into a capitalistic framework that is incapable of containing them. So, so when we talk about, um, there, there are some denouncements when we talk about it. And so you may ask the question, so how do prosperity preachers get this message, a consistent message that God wants them all, all believers to be rich. Well, they get it from the Bible, they say, uh, but they also do this thing called proof texting. And so you can get any message that you want if you go to the Bible and proof text. So you, you go and you look at one particular scripture, or maybe a couple of verses of scripture, and inter interpret it out of context. And yes, you, you can make the Bible say anything you actually want to do. And so week after week, if you listen to people preach this prosperity gospel, you will see that, that in any one sermon, they might go from Genesis to Revelation, citing a verse here and a verse there, and at the end they get this message, and they say, God wants you to be rich. So something about um, you know this proof texting, we teach in seminary not to do, right? It's just like, don't do that. And if any students that ever go to a PTS, we, we go somewhere and hear them, they're preaching a sermon, sermon based on some proof texting, we have some problems with that. So let's recall that degree that we gave out, right? <laughs> um, so so we, we, we don't expect them to actually do that to the scripture, too, because there was a, there's a context for, for, for the scriptures, and we want to make sure that is honored in all of, of, those, um, of those, those, um, those, those occasions. So now we're, we're going to talk about uh, some of the issues. Uh, one of my main concerns about Prosperity Gospel and why I, I want to um, continue to talk about the dangers of it is I believe because it is so prevalent. If you turn on your television uh, any any day and time, almost 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you can probably find a prosperity preacher preaching somewhere some of these messages. And what I find is that in many communities, this theology has permeated not just uh, some of these uh, churches that call themselves the Word of Faith. But it's permeated some mainline Protestant churches as well, especially around offering times. <laughs> All right? So if you want to give an offering, you will hear them saying, give it, it will be given to you, pressed down, shaking together, running over, all of these things. Uh, you may hear it offering time, hoping to compel people to give to the offering. So, so one of my issues is that prophetic ministry uh, may somehow get pushed to the side and, 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 uh, and, and replaced by this type of gospel. Uh, I believe that the world that we live in needs prophetic ministry profoundly because there are so many social ills that need to be addressed. The people of God need to be empowered uh, to help address some of these. There are a lot of people who need help but if the, the message that they get Sunday after Sunday is to give to God so that you personally will get uh, what God has in store for you, you can get rich and your family can get rich, then that is problematic because the prophetic gospel, the, the gospel that is concerned about the poor, the least, and the left out, gets pushed to the side in favor of a very individualistic gospel. And that should not be. And I'm especially concerned about that in some uh, minority communities, such as African American communities. And that is concerning because of the, the prophetic 
uh, history of African American uh, uh, the, the prophetic ministry and, and, and the church in the world is a profound experience that we don't want to lose. And so when I go and I visit some of these churches and I hear this particular gospel, it's like, well, there's too much work to be done in the world for this to continue to, to happen. And so when I think about uh, prosperity gospel, I my hope is that um, and to, to tell as many people about it as possible, but also to inspire many people to keep uh, talking about the need for us to be pro prophetic in the tradition of the Hebrew Bible prophets who called out injustices in their world and, and inspired people to actually uh, work to eradicate it. So when we talk about prosperity preachers, but I just want to mention a couple of other things. Uh, that it's not just prosperity preachers uh, that I've talked about who preach a message of prosperity. If we, even if we go back a little bit, uh, the power of positive thinking. Have you guys heard of Mormon Vincent Peter? Yes. Well, okay. So, so even though I'm talking about prosperity preaching and Kenneth Hagin and the Word of Faith movement, there are some other seeds of this whole new thought metaphysics, the ability of you to create your own reality that are also in this book, Norman Vincent Appeal. He defined power as the ability to control one's own life and health and destiny. So we're still in that same vein. Throughout his book, The Power of Positive Thinking, he offers stories and practical advice about how to tap into the power of God through Jesus Christ to change your life and circumstances and thereby realize a life of abundance. It's like, well, that sounds really, really familiar. And so um, in, in Peel's positive Christianity, uh, it, it didn't promise adherents that they would be rich, but it did teach them that nobody should have to live in poverty. So in the same way, it was not acknowledging, uh, acknowledging that there are systems and, 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 and ways of being, uh, uh, systems that are put in place in the world that keep people from attaining those. Yes, we have personal responsibility, but not everyone has the same opportunity. So my issue with the Word of Faith movement, positive Christianity, uh, Don Schuler is another uh, person whose name you may remember, some of these people uh, who were purporting or, or preaching a uh, positive theology, positive thinking, um, they denied the reality in the world and, and, and all of the circumstances that help to create that. So I, I, I like to uh, reject that as well. Um, in, in, in Norman Vincent Peale's book, he had some steps that uh, you are supposed to take uh, when you are trying to live a life of um, positive thinking. Uh, for instance, you, uh, whenever a negative thought concerning your personal power comes to mind, you deliberately voice a positive thought to cancel it out. So very much in that same vein as Hay, Hayden and Kenyon, it's all about you creating your own reality. So, um, uh, so him, and then there was one more preacher I want to to mention. His name was uh, Russell Conwell. He was a Baptist minister. I want to be as ecumenical about this as possible, awesome, right? <laughs> so, so he was a Baptist minister. Uh, he actually founded Temple University, uh, so in, in Philadelphia. So he uh, he 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 preached a message, and, and he had one sermon. Now this is this is interesting. They talk about the preachers. If you have one sermon that you can preach for 20 or 30 years, that's pretty awesome. You get pretty good at it, right? And so he had one sermon called Acres of Diamonds that he would go around the country and preach. Uh, and it helped him when he was founding the university. And he, in this, in this one sermon, he told story after story. Uh, but in this in this, in this sermon, he talked about the fact um, that everything that people need 
to, to make their fortune in the room, they can find in their own backyard. They don't have to go all over the world. Everything they need to be successful, to be prosperous, they already have. Um, and so his, his theology combined a Protestant work ethic with the belief that God wants God's people to be materially prosperous. And he lived uh, between 1843 and 1925. So we can see these are just a few of the people who uh, through the years have been preaching this message of prosperity in different venues uh, and different um, uh, church, church circumstances or denominations. But it, it's been there, and I believe that it is probably only in a North American capitalistic context that such a gospel could ever <coughs> be preached. And uh, before I open it up for some questions, one of the things, another issue that I have is that it's very unfortunate that some of the prosperity gospel preachers uh, who are very prominent, you may find on television, take this gospel message to countries outside of the United States that are very, very poor, right? So in some African countries, some Asian countries, there are people who are trying to give their money in, into <coughs> prosperity preaching churches, but these people have nothing. But they give, and the ministers are the ones who are getting wealthy because of, of the giving of these very, very poor people. And so when we, we, we talk about you know the gospel in, 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 in nations like Brazil, where you have people who really live on just the most meager fare, and they are giving all of their money into this prosperity gospel, it would seem that, that that's just not right. But that's what's happening. They are trying to get rich because the message that they're giving, the pastors are saying they can get rich. And I want to make it clear, some people may say, I don't understand why people would ever fall for this gospel. It, it, it boggles the mind, it doesn't seem to make sense. Well, let me put it this way. There are some people for whom our current economic system does not work. They have not been able to be successful according to uh, North American capitalistic standards. They have not been able to uh, get the education that they, they need to be successful. They have not been able to get loans, uh, to get the homes that they need uh, in the current system. They have not been able to navigate the current economic system. So when some of these people go to church and they hear the pastor say, that despite the fact that you've not been able to attain material wealth by the world's standards, and they hear the pastor say, but God wants you to have it. You can have a life, just like the life of those people on TV, if you're faithful, if you give your money to God, God will multiply it back, and then you can attain the success uh, or, or the American dream, right? So we live in a world that says the American dream is why people come to this country from so many places. And so they don't get it by regular means, but the pastor says they can have it. So for them, maybe this is their shot. Maybe this is the way they can get the things that they see people around them Attain. And so many of them try over and over again to continue to give money when the people who are actually getting most of the money and benefiting are probably the preachers in some of these occasions, in some of these places. So, so that's why some people do it. And it's all come, it, hope is at the center. Hope that their tomorrow can be better. Than they today, than they're today, and they put their hope in the hands of prosperity preachers, some of whom do not have their best interest at heart. So that's that's a big part of the problem uh, for me when I think about this gospel. 
So, um, so what, what, what can we do with this? Well, okay. Well, I can say, uh, hopefully nobody will ever preach it or teach it who's in this room. Please don't do that. Uh, but then also, if you run across people who may be part of prosperity preaching churches or you hear a prosperity gospel, then you know, pay attention, but also be one of those people who, say, who says, I, I don't believe that is what God would have us to do. So I, I believe that is important. Um, so one more thing before I open it up for questions is that when prosperity preachers deny the reality of injustice, that to me is the most egregious issue that I have with it. So let me open up for any questions you may have. Charlie? Um, the pastor who brought the, the, the loan people in yes, yes. 2005 and 2006, uh -huh. what did that pastor tell the congregation in 2007 when they lost their house? Well, that's a very good question. Now, when I was looking at those guys, I saw that in a documentary. And it was, so the people who were telling the story were the people who were impacted. And the, story, and the pastors who had brought uh, the loan officers in were not part of that documentary, so that's a really good question. But there were people who talked about uh, one woman who lived in Los Angeles who had been wanting to get out of a very unsafe neighborhood for a very long time. She had let her pastor know that. And so the Sunday that he brought the loan officer in, she was rejoicing, right? Because this is a, a promise, this was a dream of hers to get her children out of this neighborhood, to get them to a much better neighborhood so they could be safe, they could have a nice house, and have a better life. But when everything went belly up, she lost it all. Uh, so they did not talk about the pastor. I don't know what happened to the pastor, uh, but I hope at some point they're held accountable for their culpability in, in that. But I, I don't know if that's the case. <laughs> Probably. Maybe so, because you know what they found in, uh, in some of these places is that the pastors were paid uh, 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 maybe a finder's fee, if you will, uh, for every person who signed up for a loan. And so uh, that, that, you know, that's just wrong in so many ways, right? Yes? I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. Uh huh. Uh, it was announced on national news last week that uh, subprime mortgages are coming back. Oh. Yeah. Yep. Really? Uh, the banks are starting to offer them again. No down payment. So we learned nothing. Mm -hmm. All, the, all the restrictions have been removed. So they do it wow. <coughs> okay. It's all about the money. Right. <coughs> Once we got away from a system of savings and loans where the loan was made to you based on they knew you personally, mm -hmm. once we collateralized that debt and sure. cut it up into pieces, uh -huh. it lost all connection with the human. Right. And it became literally a funding instrument. Sure. What still bothers me, and I come from this industry, okay. is that the mortgage notes are not owned by one institution, how do they get away with foreclosing on people if they don't own mm -hmm. your mortgage? Mm -hmm. okay. And that has to do with the servicers and they yeah. put some problem, but the underlying principle of making mm -hmm. a home loan was always the mortgage note. Sure. And that's my theory. Okay. All right. Thank you. So you described sort of the, the main case of prosperity gospel, which is really interesting. Um, can you say more about how it may have pervaded sort of more mainstream religion or evangelical religion? Or yeah. and, and part of that's around <coughs> money as well. Um, because uh, w what you, see, you have is you see pastors who know other pastors who, who may be part of uh, prosperity preaching churches who do not have problems with stewardship. There is no problem with stewardship in their churches, churches 
because they teach that everybody in the church should tithe, give at least 10% of their income. So they don't have, have to worry week after week in a while about whether they're going to um, be able to pay a mortgage or, or, or for the lights or the roof needs to be uh, fixed. They don't have any of those worries, right? Because money is flooding in because they teach their people to give 10% and to give on top of that. So I believe that some people have gone to some of these churches, heard the stories from these pastors and say, hey, you know, that's a really good idea, a good system, and I won't have to worry about fundraising or selling chicken dinners or, or uh, you know, muffins after church to try to get money. If I, if I can get my people to give regularly and I can set my budget up based on what they promise that they will give, then we can move on and, and worry about some other things. So I believe the influence, when I go to some churches, I remember I was in San Francisco a few years ago, at a UCC congregation, and it was offering time. And I heard some things like sowing seeds coming across from the person who was taking up the offering. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm at a UCC congregation. That's not part of their doctrine. And so it has permeated a lot of churches in some ways, but especially when it comes to raising money. Because it frees the pastors and the leadership team up from money worries. And they can move on with uh, doing the work of ministry in that sense. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, don't be surprised. You can go to a Methodist church or some other churches, and maybe around offering time, that is the key. What do they say? How do they encourage people to give? And if you hear this seed faith theology coming across, it's like, oh, yeah, there it is. Right there. But that, I think that's, that's part of it. Yes. Uh, I heard you encourage us to offer pushback. Yes, here. absolutely. Hear this. absolutely. My question around that is, theologically, yes. what is the hermeneutical key that they're using? I mean, obviously, if they're proof texting, there is no integrity. There but, you go. But, but, you know, I can think of immediately, how do they deal with the Psalms? How do they deal with Israel and God's relationship with Israel and the entire Hebrew scripture? So my question is, do they claim an interpretive key? Like we claim the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, right? And, mm -hmm. Or at least Barty and theology. And we would claim that <clears throat> and say, you interpret the scriptures through that. Mm -hmm. Do they have anything like that? Well, so one of the, one of the things about the prosperity gospel that make it um, so insidious is that there are some cores um, that you would agree with like the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So you could go into some uh, prosperity churches and you would hear some of those things. And, and some of the theology sounds sound, right? So it's like, okay, I can agree with that. I can uh, I, I know, know where they're coming from and, and, and they, their images of God and Jesus Christ and all that, some of which you would agree upon. But when it comes to issues of finances and money, that's where, to me, it goes off the because then they start justifying and looking at some of the, the texts, like in Ecclesiastes, when um, in some of those texts, when, um, for instance, um, uh, God is uh, in, in, in the text when God says um, that you are. Um, I think there was a text when we talk about rain. Uh, in the world and that God will reign upon the just as well as the unjust and some of those and so in some of those texts they may interpret the text to mean that you are just uh, if you follow their particular inter interpretation of God and unjust if you don't follow their interpretation of God and that uh, blessings and cursings will fall on you and some of the blessings that you will get if you are faithful is, is, is money and wealth. And so they take some of those texts um, that seem to be so obvious, uh, but interpret it out of context as, as promises that God will give you wealth and give you money. And so it's problematic. So if you talk about is there any integrity, they do have at their core the belief in Jesus Christ, the salvation, some of the things that we would probably agree with. But when it comes to money, 
they do the proof texting and, and, and it's not sound at all. So I don't think it's necessarily difficult to uh, break down their argument because it's not contextual at all. Well, I would just ask, how do you preach the cry of dereliction? How did you? I preach the cry of dereliction. Um, I mean, if, if a prosperity preacher, <coughs> I would love to have a conversation about, so, so preach the cry of dereliction. Mm -hmm. I, I don't see how that is done <laughs> with the idea of, of wealth. Correct. Uh, and it's not. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of dominating off what Linda was, was mentioning. I having known the oral Roberts theology for a long time, sure. um, the whole sea faith idea to me is, is an investment strategy. Mm -hmm. It's a transactional, if I give, therefore I will get. Right. And what I find in a lot of things that are coming out in the mainline church now about <coughs> the people that are doing teaching on stewardship. Mm -hmm. It's an investment strategy. Mm -hmm. God has invested in me, therefore I invest in something else, and then I will receive a return on my investment, which I will return to God as God's return on investment. And it, I think it has, hadn't thought of it, but it, I think it has its roots in see, its combination of sea faith theology and capitalism. Sure. But it, it just, it, you know, it, it, the whole concept of investment is sort right. of something we often get off the rails. Yeah, which is, yeah, a problem. And just a little bit. <laughs> yes. Um, can you comment a bit on, on the, the political impact that some of these preachers have had? It seems to me that some of them have become names that, that uh, you may not know as well, but, but I hear from time to time and some of the political uh, things that are going on. Yeah, so some, people, some of these uh, prosperity preachers are kind of behind the scenes. So, um, when, for instance, um, you had the flood of Katrina, this was years ago uh, in New Orleans, and uh, President uh, Bush then invited preachers to the White House to talk about how should the nation address the, uh, the situation that was happening in New Orleans. Some of the prominent preachers that he invited in, into that discussion were prosperity preachers. So you had some of the people like Crystal Dollar down in Atlanta, uh, and some uh, other preachers from big mega churches all around the country that were part of that. Uh, T. D. Jakes, I think, went in. He's not really necessarily a prosperity preacher, but he was definitely a mega pastor who was part of that. So uh, sometimes the presidents <coughs> lean on some of these pastors because their congregations are so big. Crystal Dollar, for instance, his uh, his um, his church in Atlanta is about twenty five thousand people. So that's that's a lot of people, so they can get a lot of bang for their buck if they get some of these large church pastors to come and talk about issues and how to resolve it. But the issue uh, with some of these uh, prosperity preachers being there is that they put the onus for a lot of what happened to the people back on the people. So I don't think they're the right people to invite to have a conversation about social issues because they think social issues uh, are, are not important that it is individual responsibility that is at stake. And they may want, uh, coming out of that meeting, uh, there were some things done to help the people immediately, like getting people water, getting people food. But long term, uh, some of these preachers were of no help in addressing the systemic issues that were, that were at play in New Orleans to allow that city to be flooded the way that it so, so, um, so I don't think, yeah, if, if you have a president that invites some of these people, I don't know if they're really looking for solutions or just trying to have people come and who are prominent to say that they have the conversation, you know what I mean? So, so I think that's, um, that's, part, that's part of the problem. Yes. Do these prosperity churches do any Outreach or mission or uh, Some do. Some some do. So if you go to uh, some of the churches, um, like um, some spend some time in the churches in Atlanta. Um, there are some in North Carolina as well that I've been to, and they do have some social programs. Like they feed people. Like in one church in Atlanta, uh, every Sunday at the church, there are people if they needed uh, food, they could go to a pantry and get food. 
Uh, and, and so those types of things were available. They had ministries for young people. They had a whole host of programs. So some of them, uh, uh, there were programs in place. And then one, one um, church also had a, an elementary school that was attached to it. So there were a lot of social programs that were happening, uh, not, but there were limits to some of those social programs, right? So you had to be a member of the church, and you had to be tithing uh, to become part of those, to, to be able to participate in those programs, whether it's Bible study, choir, or anything like that. And in some of those churches, the pastor, before he would see, or usually he, uh, would see some of the people for counseling, they had to look and see if they were giving, if they were actually tithing. If they were not tithing to the ministry, they could not have an appointment with the pastor. So all of this is tied to money, right? Tied to giving. So yes, there are some churches that have some, um, some, some really outstanding programs, but you had to be giving to the church to be able to participate. Which is saying like it kind of def you know defeats the the, the point of having social programs in a local community. Right? Shouldn't everybody be able to <coughs> Other questions? Deborah, thanks yes. so much. <laughs>